Alright, AP Psych, this should be the last screencast of intelligence. Um, and if you've ever wanted to argue against your teachers about a test and how it's constructed, whether it's fair or not, um, this would be one to use. I'll also put the PowerPoint up so you can cite it if you have these instances. Um, I mean, realistically, if you would come confront me with one of my tests being against one of these principles, then... I would have to do something, potentially curve it, something to balance the grade, but realize all of our tests do fall under these, so I might not be the best teacher to argue against, but feel free to argue against your other teachers, see if they know the ideas of principles of test construction, I think it'd be interesting to see, but whatever, here we go. Alright, so when we look at principles of test construction, these are really talking more for, say, <clears throat> final state run tests, but you could argue the reliability and validity part against your teachers. So when we're looking at making an intelligence test, an AP test, a EOC, an EOG, an MSL, whatever they've been called as you've been coming up, um, they need to meet these three criteria. It needs to be standardized, standardization, all your standardized tests. There has to be reliability, and the test has to be valid itself. So when we look at standardization, why do we standardize the test? It's to have a meaningful comparison from year to year scores on that test. So we want to be able to compare year to year based on, say, the, the AP test. <clears throat> Everybody has the same type of questions. Everybody has the same material to learn. So year by year, if I change something in delivery of material and I see a change in the score, I can pretty much narrow it down that, okay, scores went up because we used screencasts or scores went down because we didn't lecture in class. That's one thing I'd be looking for. But because everybody takes the same type of AP test, AP psych test, I can make those comparisons. So when you look at standardizing a test, the main thing we're trying to do here is establish a normal distribution on a test populated in the bell-shaped normal curve. So like on your AP test, you never know what's going to be a 5, 4, 3, 2, or 1. Because what they do is they take all the scores, and then they'll distribute them into the bell curve. So if you have a bunch of smart, like Albert Einstein type students taking AP Psych with you, you're going to score higher. If, for instance, you got a bunch of people who can't walk and chew gum, then you're going to be able to score lower. Like, on average, you usually look at probably, if you get 60% of the questions right on the AP psych test, you'll get a 3. And in some cases, I've seen it as low as if you get 75% of the questions right, you get a 4. So it kind of shows you somewhat the difficulty of the test. And then also, in fairness to you, it makes it easier for you, you're also compared to your peers that way. Other ways we standardize a test... <laughs> Animations are kind of annoying, but whatever. So everyone gets the same allotted test time, same instructions. Remember those long, those lo terribly long instructions your teachers got to read before the PSAT? Those are ways in which we give the same instructions. And by standardizing the test, we seek to eliminate environmental factors so we can compare performance. Like if, again, say the, the screencast versus a lecture, if my scores go up, then the screencast will work. If my scores go down... We could argue it's the screencast, or we could argue it's plan B, plan C, hybrid learning, not having enough time. So we'll probably do the screencast for a couple years just to see the comparison. But here would be your bell curve. So like, for example, so here would be your fives, here would be your fours, here would be your threes, here would be your twos, here would be your ones. So they figure out how many people took the AP test. And then the top 2% of the scores are going to get 5s. The next highest 13.5% of the scores get 4s. <clears throat> the middle 68% get 3s, which would be your Cs, which, every, which if, your if your class is truly held up to this standardization, you should get more Cs than Bs and As. The, the, the next 13.5 would be your 2s. And then your lowest 2% would be your 1s. So that's how we would graph it. Like if I could do this class my way, 
this is how we do it. There wouldn't be 90 to 100 would be an A. The top 2% of all two of my classes, top 2% total points-wise would get the A's. You'll see some of this in college. Um, in most cases in college, your harder classes will go for this. And then, like, instead of, say, you know, an 80 being a B, in some cases the course is so hard where an 80% actually gets the A. So you may see that from time to time. Reliability. When we talk about reliability with a test, if it yields consistent results, then we can say the test is reliable. So, like, for example, year to year, if most of my AP tests are 80% average, then that's a reliable test. So ways in which we would look at the reliability test, split half reliability of a 50-question test, you divide it into two halves of 25. If the first 25 questions has a significantly higher score than the second set, then we need to divide the harder questions up. But basically what you should do in a real test, if you get 20 out of 25 on the first 25, you should get anywhere from 18 to 22 out of 25 on the second. Those would be considered consistent. Equivalent form reliability. Think of your EOCs, the purple, the blue, the orange, the red, the yellow forms. Like the idea that the blue form or the purple form was harder for civics than, say, the red form. If that's the case, then the test is not reliable. Basically, form the purple form, the orange form, the green form, the blue form, the red form, they should all have similar results. And then test retest reliability. If you take the test the first part of the year and then take it the second part of the year, you should get you should get a similar score. Like we'd probably be looking at probably plus or minus five percentage points. So if you get a 90 and an 85, those are considered relatively reliable in test retest reliability. This is number two here. This is probably what you're most familiar with. Um, some of your teachers may do this. I, I don't know if you have test retest, maybe review for other classes. Like if you took AP US history, you may do, may do some test retest, kind of taking retest for review. You might see that. And then the last part of the test construction is validity. Validity is just really saying, or just because the tests are reliable doesn't mean it's valid. Validity is the test measuring what it's supposed to measure. So if you're an AP psych and I put a world history question on a test, that test is not valid. Or if you're in Unit 2 Neuroscience and then I put a personality question from Unit 9, not valid. So one thing that you'll probably try to argue is if your test, if your teacher has, say, like rewind your mind or review questions, if your teacher says there's going to be review questions, then that does make it valid because your teacher warned you about that. They said you were trying to measure the review. So realistically, you're probably looking for if it's a certain test, is there certain subjects not involved? Or does it test across multiple subjects? That would be your idea there. Now, content validity. <laughs> does it measure what it should be tested? Like if it's an AP site test, it needs to be AP site questions. If it's a Spanish test, it needs to be Spanish type questions. Predictive validity. So this would be more for your aptitude test. Like for example, is if is scoring high on the SAT, does that definitely predict that you're going to do well in college? For the most part, we would say yes. Like certain professions may have tests like the LSAT for lawyers. Um, they use the LSAT to get into law school. If you score so high, it's the idea is you're going to be a good lawyer, so they'll admit you to it. That would be your predictive. Concurrent validity, this would be kind of like if we decided the AP test was not a good measure, and instead of taking the AP test, we took like um, honors psych test or psych 101 test and then compared the two. The idea here would be the psych 101 test is it going to measure your ability to survive in Psych 101 in college? And if the Psych 101 test is better than the AP test, then we would switch the test. This is really seeing if we need a new test in a subject area. And then construct validity. And they, these, these are going to kind of be somewhat similar. But here, when we look at this, <laughs> is there any other potential well-established test or other tests to compare. 
Main thing you're really going to be looking at here is the content predictive. Those are the ones that you're going to most worry about. These are more for the people in the profession, um, the people admitting people to college. Is there something better? Is there something worse? What have you. But those would be the three sections, the three criteria. Standardization allows us to compare. Reliability does it yield consistent results, and validity does it test what it should test. And then when we look at when is a test reliable and valid, if a test has an average that is below 70, that's a C, that's considered average, scores vary widely with a 100 and a 0, and standard deviation is greater than 15 percentage points, it's not reliable and it's not valid. It's not consistent, and it doesn't measure what it should measure. Reliable but not valid, everyone fails the test, that's reliable, but because average is a 70 and the standard deviation is less than 10, because most of the people failed, it's not valid. It's not testing what it should test. It's reliable because everybody did the same, but it's not valid. And so when it's reliable and valid, test average is greater than 70, over 90% of the students pass, and your standard deviation is below 10 percentage points. So those are just some ways in which a test could be neither, could be one, or could be both. And then we look at stats that show reliability and validity. Reliability is usually standard deviation. In the school system, anything above 10 points, or if your grading scale was 7, anything above 7 would be considered not reliable. Validity, mean, average, and the pass rate. If most of the students pass, it's probably valid. If the average is... Below a C, probably not valid. So those are just some ways in which we would measure reliability and validity.